know he did tell me he was going to attend. Are we not putting it up? I'm working on it. Okay. Yeah. No? Hey, Joe, how many Rotarians does it take to run a fishing derby? Well, if you got one good one like you, that's all it takes. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Joe. But I'll tell you, I would have given the kid that caught the eel, I would have given him the prize. Yeah. <laughs> or certainly had Scott look at it. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. Well, do we have any more from the commissioners? You're recording. Oh, are you recording? Yes. Okay. Oh, so I will call to order Woodstock Planning and Zoning Commission special meeting for uh, February 24th, 2022. Uh, we do have some uh, commissioners on uh, virtual. We'll go through the role of commissioners who are here in person, and then we'll pivot to the ones who are uh, virtual. Mark, do you mind starting out the roll call? Mark, Mark Blackmore. Sid Blodgett. Uh, Jeff Gordon. Jeffrey Markoff. Joe Fogel. And then on virtual, we have uh, Doug Gordon. Yes, I'm on. Joe Adaletto. Here. David Morse. Here. Did I miss any commissioners on virtual? Yes, uh, Dwight Ranowitz is here. Dwight is here. And he is here. Is, is Timothy Young there? Because I know he was going to join virtual, but no. Nope. Okay. So and Nancy Frazier is on. So we'll move to that. Okay. Uh, designation of office. It looks like we're going to need. Let's see, one, two, three. So, uh, based upon where we have been in the rotation, that would be seating Dwight Reinowitz and Dean Gould. All right. Congratulations. And we'll note that both of them are um, uh, virtual. Okay. Um, Jeff Markov, do you mind starting us out in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Just a couple of quick housekeeping things. The folks who are on uh, virtual, are you able to hear us? Yes. Oh, excellent. I do have my laptop and camera set up. So Delia's just sharing the screen right now, but I did have it set up to kind of show a video of the commission. Uh, my usual thank you to commissioners and staff for the work that's being done. I know this is an off week for us, but this is one of our 
special meetings to uh, continue on over. Just to remind everybody, March starts next week, and we do have another special planning and zoning commission meeting for next week, our first Thursday. The agenda already went out. It's basically the exact same agenda, otherwise different date. So, and we're going to be continuing to do these hybrid. Uh, for folks who are on virtual, if you don't mind keeping yourself muted, um, so that way we don't try to pick up this, uh, too much background noise. I know there's going to be a little bit of an echo here in this room. The acoustics of this room are not great, other than sound paneling now on the walls, and they're going to be getting to at some point soon <laughs> dealing with the um, ceiling tiles to reach the type of sound. But we do have various um, microphones uh, set up. Uh, that does take us to the affordable housing plan update, which is our agenda item. And Delia, you had told me that we're up to 355 um, surveys. Yes, we are. That's excellent. In fact, that might be more than the number of people who come out to <laughs> town budget. So that we might have set a record. But the survey is done as of March 1st. Yeah. Uh, I know there's been continued reminders. Uh, I've been sending reminders out. The reminder once again just went out uh, from the town. I had sent one out earlier. Um, and we'll see what more we can get from people. So, otherwise, uh, Delia, if you wanted to go through, I know you had been drafting up some additional stuff about the data analysis and needs assessment. You emailed some stuff out yesterday. Yeah, so I and had made some additions and some corrections from the draft we have updated last week. And what I emailed yesterday is dated um, the 23rd. 23rd. And now what is going to be up on the screen is some additional stuff beyond what was emailed out, or is that what's up on the screen? Same thing that was emailed out. Okay. I don't know if you wanted me to go over it or just to remind everyone that I sent it out in case you want to take a look. However you want to go, we can move forward. Um, we are going to see about trying to get you know our documents up on the, um, the website when we, so the public can see them. Um, so we'll uh, see where we stand. If anybody didn't in, on the commission get a copy, then separately let the deal you know. I have paper copies here for those that attend tonight and anyone who didn't come tonight that would still like it on paper, Ashley can mail it out next week. Or are you gonna tomorrow drive around and deliver them to the commissioner? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. So would you like me to go over a few things on this document or go into our presentation? Well, what, is, what presentation are you doing that's different from this document? Is there something additional that you put in this document? Pull in this document uh, from um, our last meeting. It'll be good just to bring the commission and any members of the public up to speed. Is there some additional stuff and then we can move forward? Yes. I'm just pleased to have already covered. And then just one question, I think I don't know if the answer to this. Is there anything additional in presentation tonight yeah. up on the screen? It will be after I take this off the screen. And so that we don't have copies of. That's correct. So we'll so have to email. email copies out to everybody. But again, if anybody didn't get the copy from the 23rd that Delia emailed, ask Delia and she'll re-email it. So that way you have it. Okay, Delia. Hello, Jeff. Yes, Joe. I just want to note, if you haven't seen it, that uh, Tim Young has joined, if you want to make sure that that's noted. Thank you, because uh, we don't have that view up on the iPad right now. So so Tim has joined. Third is the, oh, there he is. Okay. So we'll note that Tim has uh, joined, which means we only need uh, one. So at this point, then, since we only need one, I believe, right? Yes. That will then be keeping whatever order we were trying to go, and that will then be just Dwight Reinowitz. So we'll note that for the record. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Joe. Good evening. It's all yours, Amelia. As I mentioned last week, the home value distribution, I was relying on the American Community Survey data. It's, um, I don't believe it includes 
enough home values in Woodstock, so I reached out to the assessor. He has provided me the data and had a chance to update this chart. In the text on future housing, I'm suggesting that you consider converting existing single family homes to duplexes. And that was on our strategic plan. We had talked about wanting to get back to that because right now is that prohibition on duplexes. That was long before I was on the commission. So we had talked about wanting to cycle back to that. Good to remind us of that. I believe this was in the last document, but Woodstock is in the Wyndham County for the census data, and that's where the where you get your um, income values. And so this little chart is taken from the hub FMR area and applies to the whole county. Oh, here's a chart, and I'm going to make it just a bit larger. So for the Woodstock community, we have 425 households that qualify as low income. 235 qualify as very low income, and 115 as extremely low income. And it's supposed to be a chart divides those categories between owner and renter. And this chart shows you the monthly cost for <coughs> the rentals that fall on its low income. Okay. Questions? Yeah, Joe Bowie. When you add up all these, that's what comes out to the 1.5% of affordable housing that we have in Woodstock. Um, <coughs> no, this is income based, and that's based on the housing units. So it's a different source of data because the people who may qualify according to their income may not be living in. The housing units that are counted in most of the categories. Because those categories don't have that table up here right now, but if we looked at that table, it would have certain types of mortgages and government assistance. And so there could be households that live in town that just don't live in those kinds of houses. So they're not counted that way. They could be living with renting for family or Maybe they're men and women to get by. They just don't count towards the affordable housing units. Yes, just to understand this a little better. So there's almost two data sets. There's this one up on the screen that's based on people's income, and what categories they fall into based on. Yes. The other data set is housing and what it costs and which is I think that's much more clear data. Most of the data is from the American Community Survey, yeah. five year estimates, yeah. which was the most recent data that I have available to me. Because yeah. the census from 2020 is not available yet. And this is the Department of Housing data for what they have according to what counts as affordable and how many you know, how many households would qualify if they were to apply for various types of affordable housing programs. So is our ultimate goal or any town's ultimate goal is to do what you've done, kind of figure out what people's income is, how much housing costs in town, and then try to create enough housing that Say these 775 families can afford? I wouldn't say that the towns are going to create that much housing, but 
every housing affordable housing plan should have this assessment done. Yeah. And the goal of the plan is to come up with a strategy of how to create more affordable housing. To meet that HRDG, you should get to 10%, otherwise you will not be able to successfully oppose an affordable housing development that should it be pushed on you. One thing to keep in mind about that 10%, Town like Woodstock, that's very difficult to, to get to. Uh, just because of what infrastructure or lack thereof we have, the type of jobs, the number of jobs, public transportation. So um, the 10% number, based upon the affordable housing, the way the state defines it, which is a strict set of criteria, can be tough for rural towns. In general, to try to get to quote unquote affordable housing, you use the term attainable. Housing. That's 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 a that's a bit of a different met metric. The number of communities uh, around the state were are looking that way. When the legislature took this topic up last year, they created the requirement to do this update. There was a lot of pushback against the state's plan of just saying you got to meet the state criteria. In a lot of places, like we can't. Um, but look at it in a bigger sense of what we might be able to do to be of help to people, just not a developer come in and create affordable housing apartments. And that's coming actually up now. Actually, there's a hearing next week um, to discuss about affordable housing laws again this, this session. But a lot of the efforts been looking at what to, from a town perspective, what to do to get this attainable housing to make it easier for people as opposed to the state definition. Of affordable, if that makes sense. I'm sorry to back up, but it's the state's policy that 10% of, say, Woodstock or any town's housing stock is affordable. Yeah. They define it. So if a developer comes in with an affordable housing plan, the town doesn't have a certain leeway like it otherwise does for residential development. However, if, if we meet that 10% mark or higher, then the rules change a bit as far as an, you know, you know, an affordable housing development. That's different than what we try to do with affordable housing with a little a or Ilya uses the term attainable housing. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of um, towns are looking. I'm just checking to see those of you online, can you still hear us? I can yes. hear you. Okay. There, there's a yeah. there's a little bit of feedback, but uh, for the most part, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Yeah, good. I hope I improved it. I shut the microphone. I mean, the speaker on the laptop off so that we didn't have the. Yeah, that's fine. I shut the microphone okay. off. It's a lot better. It, has, it sounds a lot clearer. Yep, I've got a question. Want to get a chance? So, just to follow up on the discussion with Sid, so the issue is just trying to meet the state affordable housing. To be honest with a town like Woodstock, that would be difficult to do. And a lot of towns are in the same situation. It's really more the way the state is looking at it, what to do from an affordable housing point of view, but also they do recognize efforts to try to deal with attainable housing as far as looking at this update. Now, who knows what they'll do in the legislative session right now? Some of the proposals are the same as last year that were shot down, and we'll see what happens this time. But right now that's kind of how they're looking at it is what is there realistically you can do for affordable housing with the capital a but also with attainable housing to be of help in general um, after i show this i could go and show that table again that's in the draft and it, trying to refer back to it but there's several columns and there's different types of mortgages government assistance tenant rental assistance and I can't remember other ones besides the deed restricted. I contacted the state to find out how we could increase the number of assistance vouchers and things like that and the mortgages. How do we promote those mortgages? I was told there's nothing we can do about any of those except for the deed restricted, which would be to create deed restricted properties in town. So where we're gonna where I think we're gonna see. The majority of our improvement is going to be creating attainable, affordable housing. 
unless you're going to be creating, you could build more senior housing that could be deed restricted. That's your 24 units that you have now. But um, unless you're going to be creating deed restricted units, I don't see that that percentage is going to change. But one, we could do a lot for attainable housing. And one of the bills in the legislature this year that was shot down last year is to include the use of accessory apartments towards the calculation of affordability. The people may choose that right to say, I already have an existing home. I don't want to move to some or build something elsewhere, but I will do an accessory apartment. So there's another push this year to add that to the way the state calculates affordable housing in a sense. And we'll see where that goes. Joe uh, Adeletta, you had a question? Yeah, I did. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, just wanted to get back at, and maybe you presented it already, Delia, uh, but with this uh, information about uh, specifically for Woodstock, what be, constitutes the uh, extremely low income and either the housing uh, cost or the rental cost, you come up with some actual figures. Uh, how does that relate to what Woodstock currently has already as either homes or rental units within those uh, dollar figures that you calculated? That's the part of the assessment that I'm not done with yet. Okay, good. I will be moving on to doing a gap analysis and I haven't finished that yet. Okay, thanks. Is there anybody else on the screen that I missed that had any questions? <laughs> Okay, we just want to make sure we don't forget. Hey, Jeff? Yes, Hey, Doug, can I ask you a question? Yes, Sid. Yeah. I'm just kind of curious what your opinion is on this so far as a builder. You've been working here in town for, for a good long time. I like dealing with ideas as far as uh, let's say elderly housing or what Jeff's talking about, the uh, accessory apartments. What about single family detached residential? Is that an option to build either smaller houses on smaller lots or simpler construction that sell for a lot less? Or is there kind of a formula that with this acreage, with this market and the demographics, it's got to be uh, whatever. 3,000 or 2,500 square foot colonial with three bedrooms. We keep looking at how we can build a more affordable house. Uh, and with uh, septic systems and wells and excavation costs, we haven't been able to come up with uh, a method of making an affordable single family houses within the, the current land use regulations or the current building environment in the Woodstock or Northeastern Connecticut, it's extremely difficult. Um, there's just those fixed costs of um, underground power, a driveway, a septic system, a well, um, those just push the costs very quickly. And that's where um, towns that have sewers, uh, towns that have uh, municipal services make a difference in terms of being able to create more affordable housing. So sewers or public water could be like a breaking point or threshold that if they either one were available with these more affordable single family detached homes be uh, an option? I don't think you'll see it with a single family detached uh, because then your land cost um, will get will be pretty high. Uh, and, you know, and, and Putnam has municipal water and we have a, uh, we built a six unit condo project in Putnam. And since we built that, the water rates have quadrupled. Um, so even the towns that have municipal services are struggling uh, as they have to replace the infrastructure that provides those public services. But, uh, you know, the, clearly uh, we have to deal with density. And one reason the senior housing project works well is that they have those units are on a fairly small site. And I'm pretty sure that is on the sewer system. Um, so those, that helps. 
If I could just uh, pick a brand for one more thing. Uh, mixed use, uh, apartments, multifamily. Is that what we should be uh, considering? Would that get us to this goal of an adequate number of either affordable or attainable? Uh, Sid, I don't think in your lifetime or my lifetime, we're gonna get to that 10% affordable uh, goal for the Wood town of Woodstock. It's just, we don't have the growth. Uh, we don't have the other services that are required to be able to meet some of those things. Uh, but I do, I do think multifamily is definitely one way to help. You know, we look at it over the longer terms um, where we had Tom Lasky build Cornfield Point and Woodstock Meadows. Uh, when those first were developed, uh, they were reasonably inexpensive homes. But now, um, you know, it's not quite, it's quite common those to be to two to $300,000 for a unit, even in those projects, which have a fairly high density. But uh, the opportunity, the, the desirability of Woodstock has, the market has driven the cost of housing up because people really do would love to live in the rural countryside of Woodstock. And I guess with Cornfield Point or Woodstock Meadows being so expensive, it's not a whole lot more to get that single family home on a couple acres in a more rural setting. Is that right? Well, as I mentioned, we continue having trouble being able to uh, meet that goal. Um, but part of that is that we've come up with a certain way of building a house that's very energy efficient, that has long-term little low maintenance and things which drive our construction costs. There are less expensive ways to build houses. Um, we just haven't, haven't gone that route. Well, we have talked a number of times before in the commission about looking at multifamily, mixed uses, duplexes. Those are all things that we kept on our strategic plan and certainly valid to be bringing up for you know, this plan. But even after we update this plan, there's gonna to have to be continued updates and reviews to see, you know, right now, I think our multifamily regulations are quite funky, uh, and what we haven't updated them. Um, so this will be a good opportunity to revisit that type of stuff as far as where do we stand, not something, just not from the affordability point of view, but also from a permitting process point of view, where are we with that? Because that, that can add costs as well, you know, to developers who, you know, who can pass that on then as far as the overall cost. So actually some very interesting ideas in some communities, most of them have been suburbs, uh, but some very interesting ideas that have been floating around um, to try to see how to guide some state legislation. Has been how do you do multi-family, even mixed use, especially in the suburbs where they can have you know, multi-story and you can have businesses on the first floor and then you have, you know, and they also get into you know, how do you deal with parking and you know, that type of stuff. But this was some very interesting concepts being thrown around as to what could be viewed as affordable that the state could actually, you know, give you credit for. You know, both mobile home parks going to get you into your affordable housing. It'd be restricted if they weren't. In the Again, the state definition of affordability is strict. Yeah. And, and that's been the problem, you know, it, it's called 830G, that's the law uh, that people refer to affordability. It has not been updated in any meaningful way in a very long time, but the state still relies upon it and tries to add to it. And that was the problem last year that they, the legislature didn't make certain changes to it to make it more workable. They just added things onto it. And so this time around is a big push and there's actually legislation already submitted to kind of, in a sense, modernize that 830G affordable housing and say, it hasn't really been working the way it was designed. It's difficult for a lot of communities to meet that mark, but yet the state says, well, if you don't meet the mark, you can get punished for it. Um, let's modernize it and update it and rework it and broaden it. Um, so we'll see if that gains traction this year. And if it does, then that 10% rule a lot of places can actually be easier. So for me personally, I'm hopeful that that might gain traction in the legislature this year, because that would be, to me be more meaningful 
to really broaden what might be considered affordable or attainable. And then communities like Woodstock, you know, wouldn't get listed as saying, oh, you're not meeting the 10%, you're not doing something right. We actually can be doing something right, but if we don't get credit for it by the state, the state doesn't care. So we'll see how that goes this year. Is there anybody else on? No? Okay. Do you want to go ahead, Delia? Sure. And I apologize, it has the wrong date on there. I didn't realize that. What? It says February 3rd. Oh, okay. I didn't notice that. We won't hold that against you. Yes, Joe Poole. Um, could you research where the, where the water line and the sewer line are in town? There's another question of that. Uh, can you include that in that handout? Sure. We actually, in our POCD, we have a number of those maps. I don't know if any of them need to be updated, but it'll be good to have several things on. Well, the POCD was updated in when, 2015? Yes. And we had a number of maps, at least a dozen, in there, including about where the sewer is. Uh, but we can actually, that's a good idea to have some of those maps, especially if there's anything updated. And all that, I don't think they changed the sewer district at all. But the, yeah, um, it's been huge in the numbers. Yeah, yeah, it is, because there's a, you know, sewer avoidance type of rule in town. But the, um, but those those maps can be put in. We purposely put them into the POCD because they're they're helpful references. Right. But it's only a small section that has the sewer capability. Did you get so. a copy of the POCD when you joined the commission? Yes, the maps. Yeah, I can email out the maps. But some of those maps would be very helpful to be well, it's, put in. Yeah, it's especially. In if we're only going to have affordable housing pretty much where existing sewer lines and water lines exist. Well, I don't think you could put anything more on where the sewer line is right now. It's going to be biased here. Um, so, uh, but I think some of those maps would be helpful to be to put in as references so people have some idea, you know, about some of this type of stuff. Especially since when you're talking about you know, residential, really anything outside the sewer district, you're relying upon natural resources. You have to have your 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 soils be able to be properly trained. Is there a water district then also as well as a sewer district? But there is a water line. We don't have public water. Nowhere? There's no public There's a couple of community wells and they only right. serve limited populations but around there's the There's no public water line. No, town does not do that. I don't think anything comes out of Putnam to parts of Woodstock, does it? I think the community laws are located in Woodstock and they serve neighbors in the community. As far as like an infrastructure the town has for public water, that's well. For the natural resources, you know, those maps we put in the POCD are important. But one of the things we want to make certain is that anything that's being done with regards to building and things like that, the use of the natural resources and the protection of the natural resources. So, yeah, I guess I was under the impression that when Line Master caused pollution, that some water lines were put in. But I don't there's not I don't think any of that is public infrastructure. Because they're a super fun site up there. Yeah. yeah by the EPA. The they do, yeah. I remember we got a map one time when they had to do the mansion up there. Mm -hmm. And then we got this massive, you know. Well that's that's site. why I so, thought it for a super fun site for the boom. Migrating that a water line would have been put in to prevent that boom from uh, infiltrating into adjacent wells. I'm not aware that there's any public infrastructure like that coming out from that. You'd have to tell me how the water is going to be next to it. Yeah, we don't have we don't have a public water yeah, for those. Okay, thank you. But Delia's point is well taken that there have been some developments where they share those resources. Rosalind Lake shares a well and there's a well, community well over, I don't know exactly where, but it probably is over by the apartment complexes in the commons in the south. Um, it's not. Yeah, you'd have to have a really good aquifer to provide water to several units. But the multi, you know, the multi-family ones that are already built in, they have each individual unit doesn't have its own well, yeah. so they are sharing. Yeah. 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 
And that's all then based upon what they find, what the UPH signs off on. Yeah. So. They've been there for a while. Yeah, I was looking here and there. So I didn't review that, but I have done certificate of zone compliance on several large properties, including what was Hyde School, the South Woodstock campus of Woodstock Academy. And I reviewed a couple of properties that had apartment complexes and condos. And so I would have looked at stuff like that. And then the state at one time contacted me about community growth. So we have probably no, not much more than two of them. So here's the same table I showed at the last meeting with your residential uses summarized. So then we think about what's missing. What are the opportunities for compatible housing? So the types of housing and the types of permits that are required, you have single family homes and you're allowed to have accessory buildings with those, needing a zoning permit. You can have an accessory apartment allowed with the single family home with the zoning permit. That works well, and the apartments are put in by property owners who, that want them. And then you have multifamily, which is currently two plus units, and it requires a special permit. In the entire time that I've worked in Woodstock, almost 16 years, and also in the all the time that I've been reviewing regulations going back to when I first found that in the regulation, which I think was early 2000s, I just don't have the exact date right now. It's only resulted in one application, which was, I think, just as we started COVID, the COVID pandemic. And that was not for rental housing. It was for a family. Um, it was a duplex with a single, I mean, a, an accessory apartment on the same property. And then they were unrelated to the multifamily status. There were um, like guest houses for relatives. So they wanted to be rented out as a partner. Like Crystal Park? Yeah. So the reason why that application required the, or why it was considered multifamily is because it has a duplex plus the, the accessory apartment. I'm not sure if you've been following the issue of housing as it's been discussed in the state in the last couple of years, but this image is from a book called Missing Middle Housing, and this is the full spectrum of housing basically around the country, certainly not what you're going to find in any individual town anywhere near here. For the sake of the image, these units were planned together to show you all of them on one page, but they certainly are not going to be built that close together. So what would be compatible in Woodstock? We know the single family detached homes on the left in the same circle, we know the day fit. And I'm suggesting that we consider duplexes and perhaps fourplexes in the right places. And now with this discussion, we're not talking about what kinds of permits. That would be another discussion for later on. We already have some condo developments and they're very much like townhouses. I don't know that they show condos in this diagram, but they're very much like townhouses. And so then we think about what accessory apartments look like. And we have them as a detached freestanding structure attached. There's at least one wall with the primary home. Interior built from existing converted space in the attic and the basement. A garage apartment converted to a garage space and above the garage. And here's just a couple examples of small little apartment size dwellings that. I think could work well in Woodstock. Here's a bunch of pictures of what duplexes might look like. I didn't want it, I purposely did not choose pictures of houses that you recognize. I didn't want anyone to feel like I used their picture of their house and found these pictures on the internet. <clears throat> a few things to keep in mind. Something does not dictate the architecture. The photos were provided for the conversation's sake. In terms of who might live in the new, more attainable homes, think of your adult children in their first home mm -hmm. as an adult. Your parents have to become empty nesters. Other relatives, single parents, someone who wants to downsize. Your friends or neighbors who fit into one of these categories. An employee working in a local business. And you, if you fit into one of these categories. 
And we probably more than have a list here. So the, I'm suggesting that there's the potential housing opportunities compiled in rural communities such as Woodstock, include duplexes. And you could even convert existing single family homes to duplex with very little impact on your neighborhood, condominiums or townhouses, additional senior housing, independent and assisted senior living, mixed use zoning to allow residents and business on the same lot above the business or elsewhere on the lot, and multifamily rental housing. This is not to say all of these would be appropriate in all areas of town. That is a next level discussion. Talking about duplexes, I remember this was explained to me one time. Does this mean you remember why the prohibition on duplexes went in? We do have an area of duplex. Why is it actually put in the federal national zoning or some other? I can't confirm it, but I have heard a story about it that had to do with a subdivision that was completely single family houses and there was only four people in it. And it was a proposal that was because. We have another one of those hand daily interactive surveys. You can use your phone with your QR reader, or you can put in the full EV on the items to your phone. And I know that seems really funny because you have like many more items, but you have a account and full area. On this slide, there's a little difference with what you get. You can see your, your website name and your portal names, but the cost of doing that is Before we do that, I just want to make sure is there anybody, anybody on virtual that I just want to make sure I didn't miss anybody who's joined us by Zoom who has any questions so far about the PAO or comments, what PAO has gone for. Just want to make sure that we haven't missed anybody. Okay. And I think it's the way the town has the Zoom set up. There doesn't seem to be any chat. Otherwise, I'd be able to put the live link to the chat, but the chat is not available. So you'll have to type it in when you see it on the screen, or you can use your QR reader. If anyone doesn't have their phone, they can share mine. Yeah, I don't have that. You don't have your special account for the email submission. you're doing that area one of the things that you're presenting here will be basically reminding us that we really do need to delve into the details of where we are with multi-family housing mixed use opportunities duplex what's the other thing do Get the screen to be shared again so we can 
Bear with us. We're trying to see why we lost the share of the screen capability. Jeff, uh, from remotely, we're still seeing uh, Delia's screen. Lane set it up so that people can answer more than once. So maybe if people can share with someone else, they can All right. Yeah, and we have also the folks on Zoom, so we want to make certain sure people know that they don't think. So we have to see what's up with VAB. For people online, are you able to access the website? No, I haven't yet because I'm just waiting to see if we're able to get things. Well, somebody did see. So. I haven't responded. So. Don't be shy. It works. So it's polling.com forward slash Lori Adams. How about the people on Zoom? I want to make sure. Are you guys able to access the video? Have sent out, or is that something you're not able to? I'm um, trying so, to get things to get that on the screen. No. So far, Jeff, I have been able to access it. I got it to work. This is David. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, and I can see Delia's screen, and I got the um, the poll thing to work on my. I responded, but I can't hear you. Can hear us? Oh, I can hear you. <laughs> I can hear you. Obviously, you can't hear us. We're having, uh, for some reason, we're having a technological breakdown. Can you guys hear us now? We can hear you. We could hear you all the time. Hello, Joe, or any of you, can you hear us when we're talking? Yes, I can hear you. You can hear us? Yes. Okay. I can hear you. We're trying to figure out why the audio, why the visual has stop working here uh, i i don't i don't know the okay no you want to just move forward then you know, for sake sure. of time, we can just discuss some of these things more in general you know if we just can't do the survey we can't do it we can move some things you know farther along so we can see what we're able to do Don't be shy. One more chance. Anyone have any more comments to say? make? Say. Yes, I'm sorry. What? Did you get in? 
Uh, I just got on now. Okay. Mark? Oh, yeah. I'm so focused on this. I didn't hear what you were saying. <laughs> I don't know why my phone isn't working. I'm not going to do it, but. Okay. Well, we may not be able to share the screen if we can't get the town hall system to work that again. Who knows what it's doing and why it decided to shut itself off. Sorry about that. We'll try to see what we can do to move some things forward. Why don't we just move forward, DOE, while we're trying to see why the visuals. Okay, if anyone else has any last comments to add, I think there's one more slide. Okay. So, and you can do this more than once, but what are the individual words that you think of when it comes to housing in Woodstock? And this will make that picture called the word cloud where you have a lot of different pictures that show up. Nobody's really able to see the, the word. So, okay. Well, I'm sharing this screen online, so anybody who's online should be able to see it. Oh, they can? Yeah, just not people. We just can't. Oh, okay. All right. Do you want to let us know some of the words, Delia, so that way? Those who can't see it, we can. There's never been an easy way to operate that. They've always been a pain. So there's like a picture of a little house in the middle of the screen. And it says rural. And the words keep moving around, but it's stately, adequate, spread, exciting, cantankerous, peace, expensive, needed homes, rural, stately. Delia, <laughs> uh, big, adequate, moral, needed, and a smiley face. Bountiful, suburban, single, I think I can show these to you when we're all done. Does anyone have any more words to add? Okay. For some reason, it decided not yeah, to share. No signal, so. Who knows what it's doing? Yeah, we might need a new quarter or something. I'll, I'll talk to them on Monday. Okay. So that part of the meeting is closed. And we'll go back to the presentation. We're just not going to be able to see it. Those of us who are here. There's, not, there's only two slides left. Okay. So the next thing is to your friendly neighborhood advertising commercial for the survey. If you haven't done the survey yet, it's paper surveys over here. And make sure you tell your friends and family and neighbors. I think once we get the survey closed, uh, coming up next week, it's going to be very interesting for us to see what we have. So we have questions, comments, we're going to get to do the survey, it will be very interesting to see what people are saying. 
you know, what they think is working, not working, what their opportunities are. So I think that will actually be, you know, how, how long do you feel will take you once the survey closes to, on the survey monkey, it has it all for you, right? For each question, all the answers. That part's pretty easy if they're multiple choice or the ones where you check off the answer. The question that takes a long time is anything that has written in answers. That will take a while. But we'll at least be able to soon after the survey closes, start getting some, seeing some of the data from it. I was hoping by the March regular meeting. Okay. Not, probably not in time to send it out with your agenda packet, but once the survey closes, I'm gonna go to the libraries because I had dropped out paper surveys with the libraries and also mailed enough for all of the residents of the senior housing. And so I need to collect those and put them in. Two commissioners before the meeting with I enough time to, to review so we can work on it. We can see where we are, you know, with that. Okay. Did you have anything else on your slides, Delia? Or well, let me just raise this up just because you know, for some I've already mentioned about multifamily. What do folks think further about? The multifamily mixed uses. I mean, I love duplexing under multifamily. Um, what do we think in general about separate from us knowing we have to look at those regulations to update them anyway? What do folks think about whether or not that might, in general, those types of housings are something workable in town as far as um, meaningful for affordability or attainability? as far as delving down that as options. Joe? Yeah, uh, given what uh, we've been hearing about. Hear One second, Joe, we can't hear you. I don't know why. Any better now? We're having, we're trying to figure out why we're having audio visual problems. There we go. Can you? Does that sound better? Can, yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, given what we were hearing this evening about uh, just the cost of doing building uh, in Northeastern Connecticut and Woodstock in particular, um, you know, duplex housing in, in principle to me doesn't sound bad, but I don't know if that uh, would um, meet the needs of affordable housing in terms of the cost of building uh, a duplex to make it economically viable for the builder. Um, you know, if they, if there are duplexes and they charge a high rent or it's a high cost to buy your portion, um, the duplex isn't addressing the problem. Uh, so it, it, I think it's gotta be a combination of understanding the cost of putting in some of these uh, suggestions uh, versus how it really addresses affordable housing. And unfortunately there are certain factors out of our control. Yep. Yep. Cost of labor, cost of materials, those types of stuff are out of our control. No, I understand. Uh, it's just that's a factor to uh, recognize that uh, suggesting duplexes or multifamily housing, uh, while an approach, may not be an answer for our area. Okay. What do others think? Me. Mark? Duplexes. To me, I'm picturing. Duplexes. I picture in Boston, we have the city water and sewer. Whereas here, to put in duplexes again, how is it one well? How does that how is it being shared? If it's strictly if it's only two families, you know, with water and sewer, is that going to be separate for each side of these duplexes? Is it well, that would be regulated by the health department, but. What are they what are they doing? What happened with some of the duplexes that are in town now? They do. What about Doug Hill? Aren't there duplexes up there? Are those duplexes? As you're heading up towards Converse Street? There's those are condos. Are those condos not duplexes? Those are condos. Those are condos. I forget the name of that complex. I forget the name of it. I think that's called Fawn Hill. Fawn Hill, yeah. Fawn Ridge. Ridge. Ridge, I think. Oh, okay. Yes. Yep. 
Oh, oh, the, uh, oh so cool. The folks that don't understand the growing wealth in the Hadron Center system. But Delia said you'll find out from the from it, from public health as far as what yeah. their regs are, because whatever they're saying is not, is needed. That's uh, we have to be aware of. They'd have to sign off anyway. Uh, and then I'll guess one of those are options that like. Presidents or developers have whether they can contribute to table or for housing. Uh, that's more of like a, I think it would be more as a simple math calculation by the developer or somebody to assume the cost available at what size, whether a fork or not. Okay. I don't think there's necessarily need to go into a detox either three maybe four year buildings or in the right circumstance. Um, the, the points that uh Doug Porter brought up obviously are uh, a factor but that could somehow be overcome. Not that. It also would depend upon where we'll go. You know how much land there is, where you know, you know that type of stuff. But some of the since some of the multifamily ones that are around are other than Cornfield Point, but the uh, the other one, uh, the the meadows, that's set back a little bit. They'll drive by, but you don't see those places unless you go up there. So uh, you don't see all of Cornfield Point anyway when you drive by. You know, anyway, so and they seem to have, you know, this, there are certainly places in town where there's enough land if one wanted to consider some of that. I guess it's really going to come down to economics of building it, you know, and, and selling the units and what would be considered affordable or attainable and that type of stuff. And some of that is just purely market driven. So, Joe? Well, I just wanted to add that uh, one, I think the gap analysis that they will be working on will be very informative to see where Woodstock stands in terms of the number of, of available units already in town that are considered a, a affordable uh, either by ownership or rental. Um, but then just on, I think your last comment, uh, Jeff, the, um, the state I believe has grants for someone who uh, wants to build a, a number of units that would uh, help subsidize the building costs uh, as long as there were X number of affordable housing units in a developed area. Um, so it, usually those are limited to where they're, what towns are eligible for that kind of funding. Oh, okay. Okay. Fair but it still can't hurt to look into what are some of those, what might be available for for something that might be done in, Wood, in a town like Woodstock. It, you know, we can certainly check on that and have a better understanding. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Yes, Sid. So, uh, so I understand subsidies to towns and state can get subsidized subsidies from state or the feds to construct these. In the, uh, in the past, it was. I haven't checked to see what the current funding restrictions are, but lots of different types of funding in the past prioritized to serve communities, distressed communities. The Putnam Measure Thompson was part of the Thompson Way Qualify in Plainfield. And there's some other towns in the area, but the towns that are on 399 and also were considered a distressed community could get a lot more funding for certain types of development than other towns. And so I have to look at what the new funding is. Yeah, one can just find that out what the state actually has or doesn't have as far as some of those programs. So, especially for communities up here, separate from the cities uh, per se. Anything from anybody else? And I just wanna check to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Anything further from anybody on uh, Zoom? I just wanna make sure I'm not missing anybody. 
Okay. Yeah, from a, from a cost standpoint, uh, like Jeff said, you're going to have four units. You're going to build. It's going to be a lot cheaper than a two. Four parts would be more affordable than two parts. And those are things we should we'll have to look at. So, well, let me just raise this additional since. If one's looking at different types of housing, we, uh, we also have to look at what type of permitting process do we have. Right now for the multifamily, uh, that's special permit uh, automatically. Is that something we see wanting to keep, say all of that has to be special permit or trying to find certain of the situations might require a special permit if the developer comes in and says, I want to build a hundred units versus someone says, you know, I want to put do something smaller and do we need to make that go through a special permit? Is there a different process? It also gets into mixed uses where right now mixed uses are special permit. Yeah. Uh, and how we want to kind of, you know, handle that. Do we want to keep everything special permit. That's a certain type of process involved and certainly monetarily. Or do we think there might be some different options? keep the special permit for the big things, but things smaller scope and try to encourage some of the mixed use, you know, type stuff, especially if there's any of the old homes that someone wants to keep residential, but also, you know, lease out or run a business out of if it's not a home occupation. Do we think there might be something? We, we also gets into how we view home occupations, you know, as well versus those that are really not home occupations. But I open that up as well because that stuff we'll have to look at. Uh, as far as how we permit some of that stuff, you know, as well. So for me, I think there could be some opportunities for us to revisit the permitting for multifamily mixed use. If we're going to try to, I think that might be something that might be in the mix for affordable attainable uh, housing. There might be some ways of seeing what to do with the permitting process, but still keep emissions flexibility that when we have to have a special permit for something that's big in scope, you know, we recognize we need a special permit for something that big. But I open that up as well, folks, think that might be something as well to look at. I think there is the opportunity for some massaging, uh, or at least to take a look at some of that stuff. So. Okay. I think we've talked about that, uh, Daly. I know uh, uh, we brought that up uh, with Ashley Daly. We brought that up amongst ourselves in the commission when we were talking about ag and how do we want to look at, you know, some of the business aspects of ag and some of the, you know, the business, the non-ag business stuff. And we talked about, you know, what we might do with some permitting and things like that. You know, that the corollary to that is what do we do with regards to residential, you know, as far as some of this. So, but I think that's something we can be bringing up as well. Be thinking about what we might want to do. Okay. Sid? So, like, if I'm kind of open to the substance permitting process as well. Also, though, I think if we go down a new path, whether it's mixed use or multi family, it's just kind of nice to have that feedback or input and involvement in the process. But to say that's kind of an entry to stuff from it. Although we don't want to be so very focused on that, not the concerning modeling because you know, it's time and money and all the requirements and what the professionals that need to develop draft reports, landscape plans, et cetera, et cetera. But it's going to deal with the balancing act, I think. Well, there might be some permitting processes that might not be as full as a special permit but still the commission weighs in on, has to approve. We also have those provisions throughout our regulations that say, if at any time the commission feels that it needs something additional, uh, not that we would want to go crazy with that, but if we feel that something, you know, something is unique with that parcel or whatever is proposed, but we feel, you know, we really need to get some additional professional input or some additional reports, our regulations give us the flexibility for that. Likewise, it's nice to be able to waive a lot of requirements that might be on the books, but don't really apply to specific applicants. You know, not require certain things. 
And we've done that somewhat when we when we reworked uh, some of the, um, especially some of the zoning permit process. We reworked that a bit, and when we did the subdivision, we we reworked that to say, here are some of the basic things you need to give us. You you shall give us these things unless you ask for a waiver. But then here are other things you might need if the commission or the ZEO feels it's needed. And we we've done some of that as well to try to say instead of you got to give us everything and. Now they're giving us 100 waiver requests. We streamlined the process that way, but still kept those options as options if we feel we had to start getting those. And those are some of the things we, the way we can look at it as well. We did that, you know, again, with special permit and with uh, subdivision. And that can be a way of not tagging applicants or developers to have to give us a long laundry of things, some of which may not even be pertinent, but if for some reason we feel something is, we state it and we say, look, we need it. We still have the authority to ask it. And we can look at it that way and see what's up. Is there anything, is there anything from anybody else? We do have a meeting next week. So let me raise, let me ask two questions. I want to put you on the spot, Delia. For our meeting next week, which is already scheduled, what further do you feel there would be that you could have ready for us. I know it's like a week away. I won't be able to get it in advance of the meeting. I have a meeting on Monday I have to prepare for, but I would like to get some information on all of the apartment complexes in the condo developments that we have and maybe get a copy of their site plans and information on their well and septic and call the health department to see if I can get information on what's required for new multifamily. And do we think that you'd be able to get that for our next meeting or because I don't want to put you on the spot, but that gets my other question is, is, you know, if we're trying to get some further info from you, for example, what else is, is the commission looking at? We do have, we will have this on the agenda for the meeting on the 17th, which is our business. Meeting. It's going to be on anyway. Um, I don't think we're going to have 10,000 um, applications. I don't think so, Ashley, that we're, we have a long line of applications we're anticipating for the 17th. So we're going to have opportunity for the 17th. Do we want to still keep the meeting next week on the books? Or do we feel that might be too rushed? If there's further stuff we're waiting for Delia to, to get to us, we know we're going to need to be getting some stuff in from the survey. Also for us to be able to have a chance to see some of it ahead of time. So, so I'll, I'll open it up as far as what people think about keeping the meeting next week or do we want to how do we want to handle it but i want to make sure we are able to as commissioners too it's one thing to be able to see stuff at the meeting itself but sometimes it is helpful i know it is helpful to see things ahead of time to be able to digest it be i'm going to discussions got to and comments joe did you have your hand up yeah, I just wanted to raise a question about what's been publicly advertised as the opportunity for the public to weigh in on this. Did, did we indicate that March 3rd was also uh, a public hearing type uh, opportunity? We what? No, we haven't yet. We haven't yet thrown out the March schedule. Which okay. It's going to go out to the public soon. Um, we just told them about the February. And there's been a lot of reminders that have been out also about, about the survey. Um, so we haven't yet thrown out the March schedule. Other than what's already on the books is, remember, we always have the first Thursday listed anyway. But as far as for affordable housing, uh, we haven't yet thrown that out to the public for, uh, hey, these are the dates in March. Okay, thanks. So what do folks think about, do we think we'll have enough time to pivot for next week, or do we want to regroup for the 17th? Delia will have a chance to get more together. We'll have some more from the surveys available, get stuff out to us to look at, and then move forward on the 17th. Um, this is David. I'm not going to be in town next week anyway, so I'm... Okay. Well, we know some constables who can make certain you stay in town. <laughs> you might know more. Yeah. Joe? Uh, uh, Jeff, uh, if uh, there's uh, very little new information that would be available for next week, 
uh, and it might be beneficial for Delia to have a little more time to uh, uh, focus uh, on pulling together more information for the 17th. Uh, I would be in favor of uh, uh, just uh, using March 3rd as a regular special meeting as opposed to just focusing on affordable housing um, or not having the meeting at all, either one of those. I think the option really would be not having the meeting because we'd also then have to pivot and see what further to bring up uh, for next week. So I think trying to think of it logistically, it would be sound more that we just wouldn't hold the meeting and pick up on the 17th. Okay, cancel the meeting, that is my vote. Do you wanna make that as a motion? I'll wait, I'll wait to other commissioners if they want to weigh in with their thoughts. Uh, I'm happy to make okay. a motion, but I want to give people an opportunity to give their opinion as well. What do folks I, not I agree, I, I I agree with Joe. Mm -hmm. I'll second that, Joe. How about, how about the uh, commissioners online? How do you feel about that? Oh, that's fine by me. Fine by I me. Agree. I okay. agree with Joe. All right, I then agree. I'll make it a motion. Move to uh, cancel the meeting on March 3rd. And Mark, you had seconded it. Okay. Just because we have some of you guys on virtual, and I'm told I'm required to go through the roll so it's clear on our recording. So um, cancel the March 3rd meeting. Hearing no further discussion, Joe Adeletta? Aye. Mark Blackburn? Aye. Sid Blodgett? Uh, Jeff, Jeff Gordon, uh, uh, who did I see? I gotta remember who I seated for. Uh, was it Dean? Dwight did, okay. Um, Jeff Marcon. Right. David Morris. Hi. Joe Palula. Hi. Um, and Dwight Reinowitz. Hi. And Timothy Young. Hi. I think that passes. Okay. All right. Do we have anything else further for tonight on what Delia has brought up? Otherwise, it looks like we have a list of different things to look further into. We'll look forward to starting to get some info from the survey. Um, and then um, we do have, just to remind people on the 17th, we do have that application to turn one of the uh, lots into a building lot. Hopefully we'll get the information they're required to submit to us. We do also have that public hearing on the driveway on that lot, which is, uh, we will open the public hearing, but um, otherwise we don't have anything else yet for that meeting. So we'd like, it sounds like we'll be able to focus the vast majority of the meeting on the affordable housing and have a good amount of stuff to uh, to pick up then. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Mark. Now that we voted to cancel that, what head was it that third originally for the legal training? No, we canceled that. Okay. I meant what is that? No. So what we did was we voted to not do the legal training. Then we looked to see about um, in June, tentatively. And uh, Rich Roberts told us that he could do June if we wanted to pivot to that or some later. Mm -hmm. time. But we decided we would. Defer on the legal training until after we get through affordable housing. So that's where we stand on it. So that 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 we can cancel for the third. So he's off his box. Well, we wouldn't be able to because we have we, we want to be able to get him some questions and other things like that that we have, and we wouldn't have time to give it to him and then him to be able to prepare it and get it out to us. So okay. Um, I think then that, is that is that all you wanted to present tonight, Dalia? Yeah. Is there anything from anybody else before I ask for adjournment? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Young, did you want to make a motion to adjourn then? I move to adjourn. Second. So motion by Young, seconded by Blackmer to adjourn the meeting. I'll go through the roll. Joe Adeletta. Aye. Mark Blackmer. Aye. Sid Blodgett. Aye. Jeff Gordon. I'll vote aye on that. Um, Jeff Marcotte. Aye. David Morris. Aye. Joe Palula. Aye. 
Uh, Dwight Reinolds. Aye. And Timothy Young. Aye. So that's so fast. Okay. I apologize that we had some AV issues with the system here at Town Hall. We're going to have to look into why certain of the systems.